नमस्कार मे ट्वेंटी सेवन टू थाउजेंड एंड ट्वेंटी वन थर्स डे वेलकम टू डेली ग्लोबल इंसाइट विद श्री एंड श्री एपिसोड नंबर वन सेवन टू सम स्टनिंग न्यूज कमिंग योर वे फासन योर सीट बेल्ट एंड गेट रेडी फॉर अ रियली फास्ट ड्राइव श्रीधर जी वेलकम टू पी गुरुज चैनल एंड एज ऑलवेज यू आर को होस्टिंग दिस फॉर द लास्ट वन हंड्रेड एंड सेवेंटी टू सेशन हियर इज द लेटेस्ट वन सर वेलकम टू वेलकम टू द चैनल एंड लेट्स हैव सम फन टूडे great good morning everybody and good evening to those in india and uh, uh, the respective locations around the world we're looking forward to an exciting thursday as we begin the wrap up or wrap down for the weekend and we start as always with us news the De- department of homeland security chief mayorkas tells congress the border is closed no further invasion along the southwest border i think this is some one of those self inflicted wounds that they think they have healed your thoughts i think uh, this is a congress briefing um and it is uh, well orchestrated uh, to be fair to marcus you know uh, he was just followed following the policies which the biden administration has laid out so there was the surge there was the unprecedented access in uh, lots of uh, questions propped up uh, the vice president is yes yet to turn up um after more than 60 days or 90 days since her nomination uh, they seem to have closed the borders whether that has stopped infiltration one never knows but at least he is saying they have prevented the surge there's no longer buses uh, lining up in the borders to bring these people and spread them across various centers and shuttered chinese houston consulate called a major hub for science and technology espionage worldwide and uh, this was something that happened during trump's term isn't it this is something that has happened preceding and went went on and until it was terminated so in two, it, this apparently started somewhere around 2015 and went on till about 2019 so georgetown university center for security and emerging technologies was asked to examine and they looked at 642 different international technological cooperation opportunities between 2000 and 2019 identified by the chinese diplomats and the chinese um technocrats um and they found the link to these diplomats and the technocrats where where to the houston houston embassy or what they call the houston post that seems to have emerged as the key hub for collection and globally uh disseminating this information out of the houston post uh that is the uh that is the findings which has now come out no wonder that when this embassy was uh was raided or attempted to be raided there was a diplomatic furor that was raised as a whole bunch of documents that were burnt and it was burning during that period of time remember during i don't know which episode it is but we did cover that in the uh, yes, uh, in did. the DGI, in the dgi program so it is fairly evident that this was the place from which the technic- technological espionage occurred and they have listed the number of projects and programs uh, which was examined by the georgetown center for security and emerging technologies and viewers would remember that dgi that is daily global insight started when trump was still president in fact we started uh, as the lead up to the election started and and though there in lies a, the tale and a tale and we'll be there for a long long time to come the next item as the covid-19 fallout continues a new report shows that biden administration halted the probe linking lab leak to covid-19 why 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 stop this probe why what was going on in their minds Well I think the latest developing story is that there is a lot of heat uh, we have again covered in the past few days in the DGI every house rep every senator has raised these issues in fact um Rand Paul um and um and and Marco Rubio not Marco Rubio um Ted Cruz have been very vocal that uh, for Fauci to come out and speak about what happened and what he knew at that point of time and what he did not share and uh, the heat piled up and slowly information has reached out it's possible that it originated from a lab rather than from uh, natural organic circumstances apparently now the news came out yesterday 
that uh, it was Biden administration which stopped the probe. Then as the heat began to pile on, the latest breaking story is Biden has said reopen and re-examine and let's get to the bottom of this. Whether they will get to the bottom of this remains to be seen, but at least he seems to have reconciled or conceded to the fact that he cannot hide any further behind the shadow of hiding this investigation or stopping this investigation. I think um, the Biden administration owes a, a big uh, answer to the people of the United States. They need to explain why this was stopped. And if it was not stopped, what was the real reason why it went slow? Now that it is coming out, I think it's, it's very important to share the truth with the people. That's my two cents, sir. And let's move on to the next item. Trump says, China took care of Joe, took care of Hunter, but for my efforts on vaccines, millions of lives would have been lost. Like him or hate him. This part of it is very true. What are your thoughts, sir? I couldn't agree with you more. And he has... Uh as this investigation, as the, as the investigation around the COVID picks up, as the wave spreads around the world, whether it is wave two, wave three, wave four, whether different forms of variants, all with COVID as the origin, which is from the Wuhan labs. It's not an India variant, it's not a Brazil variant, it's not a South Africa, it's not a UK. It's all variations of the China virus, which emanated from Wuhan lab, China is well aware of the facts. The fact is that as this investigation was going on, they could not kind of rest and they needed a vaccine to deal with the issue because United States was facing significant consequences around that point of time. Maximum amount of deaths and maximum amount of infections actually occurred in United States. That's the reason why we have close to 32 million people affected and more than 600,000 deaths across United States. The vaccine was done in a record time and the person to be credited for is President Trump. In less than seven months, we had a vaccine into the market. And 35% of Americans are unwilling to spend even $1 behind climate change, Competitive Enterprise Institute poll saying says, and another 15% say they would go as high as $10 per month. At the end of the spectrum, 1% said they would spend as much as $900 to $1,000 per month to help in climate change. So this is uh, unusual that 1% actually wants to spend up to $1,000 per month to help in climate change. What are your thoughts, sir? Uh, my thoughts are I certainly do not belong to that 1%. I'm happy to be part of the 15% uh, rather than the 35%. I'm happy to give you know $10 per month. But this is another program that it is, it's a self-prophecy of this progressive and Biden. They have, they have not built an economic case. They have not built an economic narrative. They have not identified, simply they have stated, it could be the cause. So climate change could be the cause. And that's why you have floods. That's why you have changes. Now they're going to put billions and billions of dollars of money behind it. And people have no support for these types of lofty programs that has no economic outcome. Well, Japan, you have to take. Japan will tell you that it has spent zillions of dollars without making significant progress in even reducing one degree centigrade in its uh, in its uh, uh, ambitious goals of meeting the climate uh, climate change requirements. And Yellen skips House small business hearing, defying legal requirements and angering both parties. This is not the first time she has done this. What could be the reason, sir? The only thing that I can think of is, uh, you know, Janet, there, there's a couple of complaints against Janet. One is uh, that she doesn't turn up for, she only comes for meetings, but she is not seen in the Treasury Department. So, in, in fact, that ever since she was, uh, uh, you know, uh, given, nominated and assumed the role of the Treasury Secretary, she has hardly been seen uh, in the Treasury Department, on the floor of the Treasury Department. So, this one big complaint. The second is, I think, that she has been very vocal and going around and talking about uh, you know, various, uh, you know, fiscal and monetary policies and the integration. Yesterday, we covered in DGI, there has been a lot of heat around the small business programs, including the Small Business Administration, complaining that there's a lot of fraud because billions of dollars um, of money has been rolled out. The number ranges up to even $8 billion dollars. Uh, of fraud uh, as a result of all these various COVID programs and lack of scrutiny. 
So my uh, sense is that, by the way, this is bipartisan. Both Republicans are complaining and the Democrats are complaining. So I can I don't want to speculate. My only assumption is that, uh, or my only thought process here is, um, you know, she may be too embarrassed or she doesn't have the data. But to defy legal requirements and not turn up is not a pretty good sign for the Treasury Secretary. And in Indian news, India versus social media platforms. WhatsApp and India battle it out in Delhi High Court and the Supreme Court. And the latest is the compliance of the new law that is required to be done from the 26th of this month, wherein the Indian law states that any social media platform should be able to point out to the government the, the starting point of a, uh, a message or a, or a forward. So, and and this is, they, they said that this is required only for security reasons, not for every message. So they, there is some, uh, you know, nuances around which they have couched it. But WhatsApp is still uh, trying to fight it out in the Delhi High Court, saying that it breaks their encryption. I don't buy that. I am a cryptologist myself. You, you can do it without breaking encryption. Sir, your thoughts. I think you have laid it out very well, Sriji. Uh, there are two components to this. One is the uh, the shelter and the privacy laws, okay? And the second is around the end-to-end -end encryption and the ability to decrypt the encryption and provide end-to-end -end, uh, the navigation of the data. So there are two components to it. On the first part, they're saying that, uh, you know, when you have privacy, privacy laws or privacy laws, as you would like to kind of call it, so the government is saying, you are now taking the data of the client, of the customer, and sending it to Facebook, which is your principal head office. And from there, you are using that as a marketing vehicle to publish various ads and sell that data without by anonymizing in an aggregate manner. So you are saying that you are entitled to it, but the government is not entitled, entitled to it where the government is has the oversight of the people of the destination or the location of the country. So I think that my view is unless some judge is reading this wrongly, this is going to fall flat. As far as this end-to-end -end encryption is concerned, in terms of the breaking of the end-to-end -end description, by the way, in the United States, FBI and any enforcement agency, when it comes to it, can actually issue a subpoena and go after it. Apple fought this in one point of time on a security case which related to, you know, some terrorist or terrorist groups uh, using this platform uh, to disseminate and send messages across. So they, that didn't fly high in the court and Apple had to concede and open their encryption and the data to be found. So my feeling is that the so government is saying, I'm not asking you to decrypt and show me every message that is coming in, but I should have the right uh, to choose. So the way the Facebook will argue is you are vi vi violating, you know, indiscriminately the laws. That's for the court to determine. But to say I won't give you access at all, again, is going to, you know, fly short uh, in my view because it certainly has not worked in the United States. And banks have sanctioned over 15 lakh crores to 28 crore beneficiaries, that is 280 million beneficiaries in the past six years. So 280 million works out about one in five uh, uh, Indian citizens, sir. Uh, that's a very impressive number. It's a very huge program that was targeted at the, uh, as part of the financial inclusion program. Uh, if you look at, if anybody is aware of the uh, the Safari program that was launched in uh, uh, in Kenya, in Africa, uh, you found that the first thing was to give everybody a bank account. So we do have, as part of the um, Jandan Yojana program, you know, everybody has, and close to 400 million people had access to bank accounts with the Aadhaar as the linking mechanism. The next thing that came out is, whether some of these people who are tradesmen and, you know, workers and agriculturists, etc., whether they should be extended a loan. So this program is about the loan. And it is quite a massive program when you put the deposits, when you put the bank accounts in conjunction with this um, 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 uh, program that has been uh, that has been launched. And 28, 280 million people have benefited from this. I think there is a ceiling of 10 lakhs, maximum of 10 lakhs, and broken into three tiers. The objective of pointing out this is this Mudra program has been reasonably successful in terms of deployment. One needs to assess what the credit quality has been 
and uh, what the outcome from uh, the repayment of all these loans that's been dispersed. And India expresses support for re-election of Antonio Guterres as UN Secretary General. How has been his performance in your opinion, sir? Uh, UN has been defunct for the past four years under Trump administration. There's been nothing that has uh, that has happened. Um, you know, basically, he's um, Trump was um, uh, stating Nikki Haley was the uh, nominated UN uh, U.S. ambassador to United Nations. Uh, it was fairly passive. It's only under Biden it has resumed. Uh, you know, Antonio Guterres. I mean, UN, UN is a controversial organization which has not had. Either reforms or changes, it still remains a large behemoth bureaucracy. But from an Indian point of view, for uh, Mr. Uh, Jay Shankar, Dr. Jay Shankar, not Mr. Dr. Jay Shankar, to go and meet with the Secretary General, reaffirm is just uh, another diplomatic protocol that uh, he leveraged in the time window. He's actually back in, uh, I, I think he's back uh, later this, um, uh, he's back this morning. In fact, he went last night back from New York uh, to Washington, D.C. And his first diplomatic uh, or first high-level meeting is with uh, the Defense Secretary of uh, United States. Oxygen arrives from Gulf countries and Russia sends more Sputniks to India. So I think the situation now is fairly better in terms of availability of oxygen and vaccines. And we've already shared a couple of days back the roadmap of how many vaccines are going to be manufactured for use in India. So I think now, I think the government has got a grip on this. What would you say, sir? Well, I think they're slowly getting the entire, what I call as the value chain, the downstream value chain. One is the upstream value chain. The upstream value chain is around the supply uh, and production. The downstream value chain is the distribution and reach to uh, the patients and healthcare workers and hospitals. Um, oxygen was one of the big bottlenecks. They, you know, a combination of um, industrial commercial oxygen production um, as well as the um, as well as the uh, what they call as the liquid medical oxygen, um, as well as the imports has considerably helped India in terms of augmenting both the supply as well as the distribution chain. Um, and I think this is probably by default um, much needed healthcare transformation and reform so that it the entire ecosystem uh, reaches the vast masses that has been found wanting since independence in India. And energy, I, India infrastructure programs, pharma, solar, mobile, auto and startup ecosystems are the future drivers of the 5 trillion economy. Today there are 56 unicorns valued at close to $285 billion, and this number is likely to be $1 trillion uh, in, um, by 2025 with 150 unicorns. So the, the startup ecosystem in India appears to be thriving and appears to be heading uh, considerably uh, north of uh, what it is today, sir. What are, you, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are, I think, that there are two components. Is One is that uh, one of the uh, segments that seems to have adapted reasonably well and has also been helpful uh, in serving the needs of the COVID pandemic is the startup ecosystem. Um, the capital continued to flow in. And what I'm hearing from the experts, and that is why I've cited these numbers, that Today, it's a $285 billion valuation comprising of 56 unicorns. If it gets to 150 unicorns by 2025, it will be, if not number one or number two, in the startup ecosystem. Obviously, United States, China, and, uh, and uh, uh, India, United States and China compete for the number of unicorns, but the rate at which India is evolving is a very positive sign. And if the valuation is $1 trillion by 2025, it's a considerable achievement in the capital, private capital formation and the development of the industry. Remember, $1 trillion is could be 20% of GDP by way of capital to be infused in a $5 trillion economy. India is not going to be $5 trillion by 2025, maybe $4.3, $4.4 uh, trillion by then. Uh, but still, it's a significant number and it augurs very well. And now let's take a look at global news. Hamas surges sadly, but the Palestinian problems persist. What are your thoughts, sir? This, this whole 
you know, fracas with uh, rocket launching close to 3,000. And then 20% of the rockets were falling on Hamas side and that was leading to a lot of deaths. And they were trying to paint that as being caused due to Israel. All this stuff, what has Hamas achieved? And more importantly, what have the Palestinians achieved? Uh, this has to, this is a very interesting way we, we can parse this, right? One is Hamas has benefited because the ceasefire seizes the bombings, preserves whatever the existing infrastructure that has been untouched by the Israeli efforts by way of bombing and all the kinds of um, persistent efforts that Israel put on to put out all these rockets that were coming out. So clearly that the Hamas seems to be benefiting uh, by virtue of the ceasefire. Not only that, there's a significant amount of capital or money that is flowing into the Palestinian territories. Begs the question, how much of it is going to Hamas versus how much of it is going to Palestinians? The Biden administration has allocated specific amount of capital towards the rebuilding of Gaza. Now that begs the question, you know, when you rebuild Gaza, are you building, rebuilding the Hamas infrastructure or are you building for Palestinian? By the way, this is not the first time this has happened. Again, Palestinians are going to be found wanting, by which I say found neglected, not found wanting is more inappropriate, found neglected, and you find other periphery people benefiting, and they are probably going to remain where they are. And this is the issue that has been for the past 30, 40, 50 years. And Secretary of State Blinken turns to effective partner Egypt to calm Mideast. Then he travels to Jordan to meet King Abdullah and also, uh, you know, uh, uh, many other constituents on it's, it's a complete Palestinian mission. But now he's back in the United States and he will be meeting, as we said before, Dr. Subramaniam Jayashankar, isn't it, sir? Now, uh, yes, he is expected to be back by tomorrow, uh, by today, you are right. Uh, and um, the... It is believed that um, uh, Egyptians played, Egyptian President al-Sisi played a significant role in, uh, in, in, the, in the ceasefire uh, and helped uh, negotiate the ceasefire between Israel and uh, the Hamas. And Israelis have a, also have a proximate relationship to Egypt. So naturally he is visiting there to figure out uh, whether there is continued monitoring by the Egyptians to make sure that there is no further trouble brewing. Now, obviously, there's a significant amount of Palestinians in Jordan. If you know that they all work, quite a number of people work in Jordan. In fact, there is a belief that more Palestinians are in Jordan than in Palestine itself, uh, which sometimes creates problems for the Jordanians. Um, so he's definitely meeting King Abdullah, uh, who is still, you know, um, an influential figure in uh, quell in uh, you know in quelling the the storms that arise in that part of the world. Uh, so he's completing his diplomatic mission, Israel. Egypt, uh, also Palestinian representatives. In fact, um, I, we didn't present it for the sake of the Palestinian representative, Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammed Abbas, when Antony Blinken was, uh, you know, speaking, he was referring to referring to him as uh, Secretary Clinton. Uh, so he still is in the world of Hillary Clinton while Antony Blinken uh, was making the presentation until his until the officials of uh, Palestinians corrected him. No, no, that's not uh, uh, Secretary Clinton. That is Secretary Blinken. Uh, who is uh, who is giving the lecture in a bit in a bit of a, a embarrassment? So he did meet the Palestinians. He did have this session. There was a public session, and then of course he's completed his mission by going to Egypt, and he will be in Jordan and returning back to New York, the uh, United and, States, sorry, Washington D.C. And a Belarusian leader defends his action to divert the plane. We talked about this yesterday, and yeah. and also Biden says that the Nord Stream pipeline ban would have hurt European relations. So this is a one-line headline, but I think there is a lot of subtext here. Could you please share your thoughts on this? My thoughts are Biden has been on pressure on a number of initiatives. Cartoons have appeared in U.S. publications, not in the left-leaning, left-wing publications. They don't publish any of these things. Everything is hunky-dory, even, even if it is wrong. This famous cartoon, which uh, you know, maybe we'll uh, we'll we'll put it up in the uh, 
uh, in the in the in the uh, uh, what you call as the text that goes out uh, with the with the presentation. You see, you find President uh, uh, President Biden standing next to Keystone Pipeline, which shows uh, pipe is closed, there's no oil. Then on the other side, you have Vladimir Putin, which is to say Nord Stream Two is open and gas is flowing into Europe, um, but we still talk about climate accord. So the fact is that uh, the, the byline here is that there's been a lot of pressure. It seems like that Germany and parts of Europe has played a significant role, which is without this gas, there is no heat. And still, United, uh, Europe has not come out of, or the, the summer season has not set in. This is the most inappropriate time for you to cut off uh, supply. But we have also covered in a number of DG shows, uh, DGI shows, that uh, you know uh, Russians have been having problems with Czechoslovakia, Poland, Germany, Italy, quite a few countries they have been having problems, including UK. So this may be the uh, the underlying pressure from some of these uh, EU nations to Biden to say, you take care of your climate accord in United States, you take care of your gas, you know, your pipelines in United States, but we can't be here without gas. That seems to be the underlying tone. Uh, and he doesn't want to ruffle the feathers of EU. That's that seems to be the the overarching message here, uh, Sriji. And you can add, and I know you have some insights as well. Well, uh, you know, uh, the, the, this was very interesting. That uh, I came to know of it through a family friend, and this person had to come back from uh, Europe because uh, you know there was just no hot water for days on end in Poland. And, and this becomes a little difficult if you are born in US and grown up here, you're used to taking a shower every day, which Europeans, many Europeans don't do. I'm not saying anything right or wrong. This is just a habit. That's a habit forming thing. And, and therefore, you know, there, there are things like this, which seems like a spigot that people can turn on and turn off to cause a lot of pain. Also, viewers, if you have a Netflix account, there is a show called Occupied that talks about Norway and a story that some very, very similar to this plays out. It's a political thriller. If you like political thrillers, do watch that. I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, being paid by Netflix to say this. I just like some shows, not all of them. Some shows I like and just just establishing an additional perspective on this topic. So let's move on to the next topic. Key scientists say that it is not safe to hold Tokyo Olympic Olympics. Most likely it's going to be canceled, right? I mean, it's probably going to be rescheduled again at a later date. Uh, it's, it's a, it certainly looks like it's going to be canceled. Uh, Tokyo is on high alert. United States has issued a travel advisory, which is not to travel to Tokyo Olympics. Um, and there's only, I think, less than one or two, three percent of the population uh, being vaccinated. Um, they have hired uh, the security forces uh, to vaccinate the nation at the rate of one million uh, per day. Uh, Japan is 126 million. If you discount 126, one, I think it's 126 million. If you discount roughly X number of uh, children and so on, you still have 80 million people. And I just don't think they have the time window to get this done. Um, and also, uh, they're still in a heightened state of alert. So it's a wise decision uh, to cancel the Olympics. China loses Europe as Xi's hardline diplomacy backfires. Taiwan accuses China of blocking its deal with BioNTech. Taiwan, Korea, Japan contemplate homegrown vaccines. So again, China is being playing is now again shown being a big bully, sir. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I just want um, all of our audiences to actually look at global mainstream media. Okay, global publications. And when you look at global publications, you will not hear about United States, you will not hear about Europe. But you find often two countries which are presented in two opposite sense, two opposite ends of the spectrum. One is India and the other is, uh, is China. When you look at China, China is the culpable culprit who is escaping the wrath of the world on the COVID, which has paralyzed the world, okay, number one. They have been successfully using this navigation of shifting as, you know, Brazil, South Korea, South, uh, Brazil variant, African variant, Indian variant, etc. So you have one. You have a big issue on Uyghurs for which world is asking for sanctions. This is on China. Three, you have big problems around stealing of technology and issues around technology, privacy and intellectual property violations. 
Then you have problems around democratic principles in Hong Kong, where democracy has been suspended with ubiquitous takeover of the Hong Kong uh, legal process and the legislative system. Then you look at the daily incursions and trouble that happens in South China, threatening the sovereignty, sovereignty of Taiwan and all the nine dot nations around the South China Sea, be it Philippines, be it Indonesia, be it Malaysia, be it uh, um, uh, Vietnam, etc. And also incur incur incursions into Senkaku Islands near Japan. Okay, you have that. Then you have trouble in the Ladakh region or the Himalayan Kingdom, right? Yet you have, and the final nail in the coffin is the EU rejecting, EU rejecting after initial acceptance. Again, we have covered this that EU did accept uh, in the DGI program that China's investment proposal, China to invest. Then the Uyghur issue came in and China said it is going to um, you know, uh, basically reciprocate with the similar sanctions on some of the EU nations and key officials. So EU summarily now has cancelled the investment proposal, putting Xi Jinping in most difficult and most embarrassing situation. Australia, his trading partner, is not in acceptance. Japan, the trading partner, is not in acceptance. US is not in alignment. EU is not in alignment. Yet, the nation that gets the worst end of the stick, as though it doesn't have reach, is India. So you require huge amount of money and penetration into a vast empire to control the narrative and the agenda. And that exactly is the one sentence here, which is to say, China loses Europe as Xi's hardline policy backfires. There's a significance. July 1st is the Communist Party Congress annual event, it's going to be interesting to see how Xi Jinping comes out of it. And we will see, and now in markets, Amazon to buy MGM Studio behind James Bond and Shark Tank for $8.45 billion. I think we mentioned this a few days ago, so it has come true, sir. As always, the oracle of P Gurus has spoken and got it right. Well, you know, the deal was very much cooking. So, you know, so I don't want to claim a great, uh, uh, what you call citation or uh, thing for that. But I'm very happy that it has happened. I think, you know, I'm a James Bond fan and I'm a Goldfinger guy. So therefore, you know, I'm happy that Amazon has got it. I get a chance to see uh, all my programs, uh, you know. So I'm very happy about Amazon's acquisition of um, of uh, the MGM studios. And then, of course, Shark Tank is very widely watched in the United States. Um, I do see occasionally because some very innovative ideas and concepts get presented in the Shark Tank. So I'm very happy that that uh, transaction is closed. Yes, indeed. I love uh, I love uh, James Bond also. I like to always uh, think of myself as uh, the name is Ayer, Sri Ayer. But anyway, <laughs> this is all <laughs> dreams in your one's own mind. And, and I think markets today were tepid with reopening of stocks helping just the standard and poor's, but by and large, it was just sideways movement. And I think that with that, our uh, day GI for today comes to an end. We'll see you again tomorrow, bright and early. Sridharji, Namaskar and see you tomorrow, sir. Namaskar. And I want to conclude with one important uh, observation. Uh, yesterday, uh, you know, the 25th of uh, 26th of uh, May, marks the completion of 125 years of dough, the 125 years of the dough index. When in Wall Street, they started with about 12 stocks, people used to run around and see what is the bidding and what is the offer price. And uh, three times in a day, uh, they will mark this. It will be in a paper and these fellows will run around the Wall Street uh, and distribute as to what the, the prevailing prices for uh, the uh, the stocks being traded in uh, and then the index was born uh, with various uh, you know weightages and so on and so forth it's a remarkable history but just want to say that 125th anniversary of Dow and it's still going strong thank you very much sir and see you tomorrow namaskar namaskar and have a wonderful day and have a wonderful evening